Okay, so uh, today we will start a new chapter, chapter eight, uh, root locus technique. This is a graphical method. The graphical method uh, that represents uh, uh, design and analysis uh, of any control system. And the advantage of this one is uh, uh, we can avoid some calculation, complex calculation that require to see the system behavior, especially uh, the responses that we are going to see is two type of, this is a graphical technique and this will allow you graphical technique that will allow you to design an analysis. Uh, so most of I say design analysis, but actually analysis comes first and based on that you do the designing. Analyze then design of any control system. Control system and what we are going to design, two things we are going to design. First of all, stability. And secondly, we also have to design uh, the transient behavior. Okay, so these are the two things that we are going to design. And if you want to go in detail, uh, then what what type of stability thing we are going to design is the uh, range of stability, range of stability. Then we have range of unstability, range of actually instability. Then we have condition for oscillation. Condition for oscillation. So these are the related to the stability and then the transient behavior information that you can uh, analyze and design is Basically, the first one is your percentage overshoot. Then we have settling time. And then we also have the peak time. Okay, so this sort of information can be graphically uh, analyzed and designed to uh, using this tool uh, that is known as root locus. So whatever we have discussed up to now, this can be one question. The question can be, uh, what is the significance of root locus? So question, what is the significance of root locus? Okay, so root locus technique, maybe five marks question. Now, before going to actually root locus, uh, we have to know uh, why we are going to root locus. So for that, we actually have to discuss the uh, two problem of the control system. So control system problem. I kept you uh, unmute because of the fact that then you can actually ask the question if you have any question. So if you are entering to the class, try to mute yourself. Whenever you have any question, then you unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, so now, uh, what are the problems of the control system? Control system problems that we have we in general deal that first of all, uh, 
Number one is difficulty in finding the uh, closed loop poles. So, diffy. Okay, so what we the problem that we are seeing is sometimes the pen doesn't behave that it should behave. Okay, so the problems are number one is closed loop closed loop poles, closed loop poles. Okay, so they cannot be easily figured out. This is one problem. And the problem number two is dependency. Dependency of closed loop poles on the varying parameter. Okay, so these are the two problems that we in general say. We actually haven't said uh, what is clo uh, the root locus. So the root locus, the definition of the root locus in brief without going in uh, detail is uh, graphical representation of the mm -hmm. closed close loop poles uh, as the system parameter varies. So graphical, and a brief what it the root locus is graphical representation of closed loop poles as as a system parameter system parameter is varied. Okay, so what happens, what happens to what happens to closed loop poles as a parameter, so it can be any parameter, so a parameter of the system is varied. Okay. In general, whatever we, uh, in general, whatever we, so is Samin here? Yes, sir, I'm here. So why people are in the waiting room? Sir, I'm accepting them, when I'm joining the I mean, I can accept both this. Okay, thank you. So the graphical representation of the closed loop poles as a system parameter is varied. So as a system parameter, it can be any system parameter, but in general, for the case of uh, analysis, we actually say that it is uh, gain K. So it is a generally, uh, uh, generally we say gain K has been varied but it can be actually any parameter. So if you vary this one, so increase or decrease, so then what actually happens to the closed loop pole? This is what is known as the root locus. And in general, we can assume that the value of the K is positive and the value of the K is uh, ranging from zero to infinity. Okay, so the problem that we are discussing in figuring uh, why we are actually going to the root locus. One of the problems is uh, finding the difficulty in, uh, okay, somebody raised a hand, why? Do you have any question? No, sir, it was a mistake. Okay. Mistakenly, I, if we take a quiz today, how will it be? Okay, so the problem, the two problems that we're discussing, the one problem is, uh, don't take it otherwise, I was just kidding. 
So the closed loop poles difficulties of finding the closed loop pole and also the dependency of the closed loop pole on the varying parameter. In our case, we are saying K. So if you, you will, you are going to see that the pole location is actually a function of the K. So these are the two problems that we have uh, in case of the closed loop system. Say a general closed loop system is uh, of uh, the pattern like this. Okay, so we have something like this, the input. Uh, then we have uh, the forward path transfer function that is k g of s. Then we have feedback transfer function that is uh, h of s. Okay, so then you have negative feedback. Then positive input, then this is your actuating signal EAS. Okay, so this is forward path transfer function. This is your feedback transfer function. This is your output. Now the problem that we are talking about is uh, closed loop transfer function, whenever you have something like this, uh, E of S, E of S, this is your CS and RS. Uh, so what is T of S? T of S can be written as, by the way, the Abra Samina was supposed to keep you in suspense that there may be a quiz today. I'm not sure whether he did it or not. So K, G of S, H of S, so now, as you can see here from this equation, uh, the denominator, which is the characteristic equation, uh, is actually a function of uh, k. So to make it even more specific, uh, what you can do is we can assume that g of s has two part. That is numerator of g of s. Then you have uh, denominator of g of s. Uh, this is nothing but the zeros of G of S, zeros of G of S, and this is poles of G of S. So only 37 of you are actually are attending in the Google Classroom, so which is, uh, I think, way less than actual number of the students in the section C. So all of you are requested to be there. So I am providing the contents. Uh, if I feel that you're not actually attentive or serious, then we can take uh, some other measure to make you attentive. So we also have numerator of H of S. Then we have denominator of H of S. And these are the actually zeros of, zeros of H of S. And, uh, Poles of H of S, poles of H of S. Okay, so put these two value into this equation. What we are going to get here is P S equal to K numerator of G of S divided by denominator of G of S, one plus K numerator of G of S divided by denominator of G of S uh, into numerator of H of S divided by denominator of H of S. Okay, let, let us try to simplify the thing. Then what we are going to have is A times numerator of G of S divided by denominator of G of S. Now, if we try to simplify, then what do you have? Denominator of G of S, denominator of H of S, and then here you have both denominator of G of S, denominator of H of S. By the way, I forgot to tell you this chapter is very important for uh, the exam as well, as well as uh, understanding the control system, uh, designing and analysis. Exam means which exam, sir? 
I'm not sure whether I'll take a three hour exam or two hour exam or five hour. So oh. let's, let's decide what happens. So, but whatever the exam will be, a lot of the question is going to come, even if it is a viva from this chapter, or uh, this technique could look us. Okay, so now if you finally uh, cancel the few parameters that can be cancelled, like this one, this one can be cancelled with this one. Now this one will go into the top. So what we are going to get is k uh, numerator of g of s. Then you have denominator of h of s, and then you have. Uh, d g of s uh, d h of s okay so simplify uh, initially actually i was uh, i was thinking that uh, maybe online class will not be a very good idea so i was having not any classes actually having a lot of free times then gradually I become uh, uh, bored, I become uh, obsessed with small things because without the work is very difficult for human being to survive. So that is why right now I think it's not that bad to actually go continue. And also some few students give me a feedback that Actually, in physical class, they miss so many things. But in the online class, uh, since the video is uploaded, they are actually getting more benefited. Something they fail to understand. They can actually uh, get help of the video to understand the thing. So I think you should actually focus on the study more. That will help you to survive the depression or the boring boredom that you are going through. Nowadays, I find very hard time actually to sleep because of the fact so many classes, so many things. Online classes are very difficult than the physical class. Okay, now the problem that we are discussing. One of the problem is uh, that uh, now by looking at this equation, it is very difficult to tell. Uh, what is the poles of uh, your closed loop transfer function? The poles, a combination of both the pole, uh, both the zeros, uh, sorry, poles and the zeros of uh, forward path gain and feedback gain. This is both of them are actually involved in the poles of your closed loop transfer function. So these are actually poles of closed loop transfer function. And these are actually zeros of closed loop transfer function. So zeros of closed loop transfer function. So what actually consists the zeros of the closed loop transfer function? This is actually zero of G of S. And this is actually pole of G of S. Pole of G of S. So zeros of the closed loop transfer function consists of the two things, that is uh, zeros of G of S and poles of, uh, it should be H of S, sorry, poles of H of S. And the poles of the closed loop transfer function, it actually accounts all of them. So all the poles of zero combination of that. And also in addition, this is a function of the K here. So for different value of K, the result of your uh, denominator of this closed loop transfer function that is characteristic equation will be different. So it depends on uh, the value of the K. So that is why it's difficult to actually figure out every time for a different value of K, your characteristic equation will be different. So this is another problem. So for that one, instead of deriving or going to a lot of mathematics like this, we actually go directly with the open loop transfer function gains. We directly try to figure out a graphical technique that helps us doing the analysis and design. 
without doing much uh, mathematical equations. Okay, so whatever we derived here with a physical example, try to see what it actually means. Say uh, G of S is having something like this, S plus one divided by S into S plus two. So this is the zero, this is the zero, this is the pole of G of H. Then you have H of S. So it has something like this, S plus three. So this is zero. And this is S plus four is the pole of H of S. So if you put it into the equation, so T of S, then what we are going to get is K times G of S, that is S plus one divided by S into S plus two divided by one plus K G of S, that is S plus one divided by S into S plus two into H of S, that is S plus three divided by S plus four. Okay, so I'm just keeping one line. Uh, what we are going to get is uh, because of the fact that we already derived it, so this value and this value will be canceling each other. Okay, so and this one will be going top. So what we are going to get is K S plus one, then you have S plus four, and then you have all, all, all these, all these actually will be going here as well. So uh, S, S plus two, S plus four, all the poles, the poles of a G of S and poles of H of S plus K times the zeros of G of S and H of S. So plus S plus one, S plus three. Is it okay? So as we already said that uh, zeros actually consists of zeros of G of S and poles of H of S here. Okay. So this is the truth here. So this is nothing but uh, zero of G of S, and this is nothing but all of H of S. And it is easy. So zero is not difficult to identify. Zero is easy to identify. Zeros of your closed loop transfer function. But what is happening to this one? So if you simplify, then what it is becoming is K. S plus one, S plus four divided by, so this is S square plus six S, S square plus six S plus eight, multiplied with S plus K, S square four S plus three. Okay, so now finally what we are going to get is uh, k s plus one s plus four then if you simplify it further s q plus six s square plus eight s plus k s square plus four k s plus three k okay so finally uh, the numerator is remaining as it is, so we are not writing it again. The denominator is becoming something like this, S cube, S cube plus six plus K, S square plus eight plus four K S plus three K. So as we said that uh, for the root locus, we are going to vary the value of K from zero to infinity. So for every single value of K, the electricity equation or this one will be different. And we have to set it equal to zero to find out the roots or the poles. So for every single value of K, these parameters are going to change and eventually your characteristic equation is going to be different. So uh, your poles are actually will change for every value of k. So this is the problem that we talked about. Okay, so using the root locus, we can actually, without going this calculation and repeating, even though we'll see how the calculation actually results into the root locus, but 
uh, while we are plotting the root locus, we'll see that we actually hardly have to use this calculation again and again. Okay, so this is one thing, uh, the problem of the control system. And the second thing that we want to review is the vector representation of the complex numbers. So this is review, and this is also very important. Without this, it is very difficult to understand the root locus. So we are going to review this topic that is vector representation of complex number. Vector representation of complex number. Complex number. Okay. Research ideas. So I have, I have to write so many things, vector representation of the complex area, something like this. But uh, if there is like, uh, if you can design a whiteboard, online whiteboard, where you can actually have a, a, a microphone button, and if you tell something, that will be automatically written. You don't have to write it. Then, then this class taking may be more easier. So some of you who are good at programming, they can actually incorporate a whiteboard like this with voice assistant or a microphone, something like this. Okay, so this is research idea. You can have, uh, keep yourself busy with it. Now, go, let us go to the review. So vector representation of your uh, complex number. Say any complex number is equal to sigma plus j omega. Okay, sigma plus j omega. So we need to represent it, this thing in the vec uh, vectorically. So say this is our S plane, and this is our sigma, this is our j omega. So somewhere here, it will be, and we can represent this by a vector line. Okay, so this represents our sigma j omega. Now, Vector can also be represented by polar coordinate. So in the polar coordinate, what we need? We need the magnitude and the angle, theta. So the length here can be magnitude and this angle, the positive angle with respect to the real axis can be actually our uh, uh, angle theta. So this is how you can represent it. So this is the first point, any vector any complex number can be represented as a vector um, which can be expressed in polar coordinates with a magnitude or the length of this vector and as well as the angle of that vector with respect to the positive real axis, okay? So positive direction. Positive direction, as you know, is actually in the anti-clockwise direction is the positive angle direction. Now the second review thing is, what they're saying is, if you substitute any value, any, uh, sorry, if you substitute any complex number, second point that we are going to discuss here, if you, sub, if you have any point, say the same point here, sigma plus j omega, okay? So if you substitute any point, into a complex, any complex number into a complex function, say f equal to, f is equal to s plus a, simple zero transfer function maybe. Okay, so if you substitute the value of s into this function, then another complex number will be resulting. Okay. So if you substitute any complex number into a complex function, then it will result into another complex number. Okay, so what is our new complex number? So if you substitute the value of S here, sigma plus j omega, then what you are going to get, the next uh, complex number will be sigma plus A plus j omega real parts are added together, then if you had imaginary part, you can also add, is, add with that. Okay, so this is uh, what is second property. So the second property says that if you 
substitute one complex number into a function, then it will result into another complex number. So what will, be, how can we actually find out that complex number graphically? So say we have something like this. Okay, so similar thing here. So this is actually your sigma previously what you had, this is your j omega. Now I think you have something like this is your a. So this value here is a. So what you are going to get is somewhere here, you are going to get your new vector. Okay, so this is your new vector maybe. And the new vector is the coordinate of this one is sigma plus a and j omega. This is previously as well j omega. Okay, so how can we uh, figure out the value of that vector again, magnitude and the angle. So uh, this is how you can figure it out. Or also this is also known as if you substitute a, a complex number into a function, this is also can be said that figuring out the value of the function at that particular point. Okay, so this will give you the magnitude and the angle. Substituting the uh, number into a function is also means that actually what is the value of the function at that particular point. Okay, so this is how you have to do it, figuring out the length. And now the third property is alternative representation because we know that any uh, vector can be represented by the length and the angle. So as long as it is remaining same equal. So alternatively, how can you represent this same vector? Instead of starting from the origin to the new point, it can be also started from the zero of that function, from the zero of this function. So the zero of this function is minus a. So you can start the vector from the zero of that function to the point of concern that is sigma j omega. Is it okay? So representing from origin to the new point, you can represent from the origin to the new point or what you can do is say this is your minus a and this is your previously what you had. Okay, so if you can from the minus a you draw uh, the vector. As you can see they're parallel, their length is same and also their angle is same. So if this one is m, this one is also m. So this is an alternative representation. So what you can do, starting from the origin, you can go up to the new point that you figured out, or you can start with the zero of the function and go up to the actual point from where you, uh, you actually calculate the value. So sigma, plus, sigma j omega. So they are uh, parallel to each other. That means angle is same, the length is same. So actually this is an alternative representation of uh, your function. Okay, so physically what it means, say we have one practical example, ex practical example says that you have to figure out S plus seven, the value of this one at any particular point, S equal to five plus J2. Okay, so maybe your function fs is s plus two. This is the zero, zero is minus. So what you can do is, uh, there's two way representing the thing. One is substitute the value, then figure out the value. So plus five plus j2 plus seven. So basically 12 plus j2. So this can be your new point. So this is one way to represent. So this is uh, similar to this case here, okay? Or the alternatively, what you can do, we can figure out the zero of the function. So zero of the function is at minus seven, and we have to figure out this point. So the length between them is the same thing. So for this course, uh, for this uh, chapter, we actually will take the alternative representation. That means we'll somehow try to figure out what is the zero at the pole, 
So let's say this is minus seven and the point here is five and two. So somewhere here maybe. So this is how we are going to represent the new vector. That is from the zero or pole of uh, the function f of s to the point or where we are actually concerning that is s equal to five and j2. Okay. So if you want to find out the value of the function at this point, then actually you have to figure out the vector that we figure out. You have to find out the magnitude of it as well as the angle of it. So how to find out the magnitude? Magnitude is uh, 12 square plus two square and the angle is tan inverse two by 12. So this is how you can find out both the magnitude and the angle theta. <coughs> Okay, so this uh, this this was a very simple single case scenario, but not always that you will have a function that is uh, as sober as a, just a single zero. So sometime you may have a function something like this, lots of zeros, lots of poles. So s plus j one, s plus j two, so goes on. And similarly, you have poles s plus p one, s plus p two goes on. So this can be simplified, uh, it can be written in this way, in a simpler form. Product of poles and zeros. So this symbol is actually a product symbol. So S plus ZI. So I starting from one to M, M number of zeros you have. And from J one to N, N number of pole you have. S plus PJ. As we already said, this symbol represents product. Okay, so M is a uh, number of zeros, number of zeros, N is number of poles. Okay, so if somebody asks you to find out the value of this function, complicated function, at any particular point S. Okay, so how can we do that? Based on our previous uh, discussion that we have done. So we are finding out the value of the complicated function Fs at any particular point, say S equal to S1 or sigma plus J or whatever it is. So at that particular point, we want to figure out the value. So formula is remaining same, M theta. Okay, so what is M now? Previously we have seen just one length from a zero to up to this particular point. Okay, so it's now we have N, M number of zeros. So that is why we're going to write I equal to one, two, M, zero lengths, zero lengths. What is zero lengths? From any zero to that particular point, that length is called zero length. And similarly, because your function have uh, a m number of zeros, so we have m of them. Similarly, we have n number of poles, so j equal to one to n pole lengths. So what is pole length? Similar to the zero length. So from that particular pole to that distance, this is what is called zero length. So this is how you have to figure out the a magnitude of the function at that particular point. What about the angle? Angle is also same thing. So if you divide them, angle is dividing is nothing but subtracting. So angle is basically angle of uh, the summation of the angle, you know, zero angles minus the summation of the pole angles. So I forgot the summation thing. So summation of the summation I equal to one, two, M, this is called zero angles minus 
summation of j equal to 1 to n pole angles. Is it okay? So does it seem difficult? Let us solve one problem, then it will be easier to understand what is mean by this formula actually. Okay, so go for example 8.1. So example 8.1, example 8.1, a particular function is given, the function fs equal to, so we, even though we are calling function, actually you represented the transfer function. So fs equal to s plus one, we define in general terms by function, but in our case, since it is control system, we call it transfer function. So S plus S into S plus two. So basically a transfer from the transfer function that you have is uh, having single zero double pole. Okay, so what they want to do, what us to do is they want us to figure out the magnitude of this function at s equal to minus 3 plus j4. So this is our point of concern. So what do we have to do? We have to find out the value of fs at s equal to minus 3 plus j4. Okay, so for doing that, we can use uh, the ruler or if you want we can avoid it because it will take time to use the ruler so let me know whether you want the ruler the diagram will be closer to perfect if you use the ruler but if we avoid using it then uh, the less time will be required so we can cover more topics Okay, so if you can understand without the ruler, it will be better for me as well because it's time to resume. Okay, so we have something like this. Okay, so say this is your uh, one two, three, four. Similarly, one, two, three, four. So, where we actually have uh, the, now, uh, poles and the zero. Let us place the poles and the zero first. So at s equal to zero, we have a pole. Here we have a pole. At s equal to minus two, so this is minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. Okay, so at s equal to minus two, have, you have another one. At s equal to one, you have it. Okay, and what is the point of the concern? The point of the concern is minus three. Uh, so this is one. Sorry, it should be here. So somewhere here you have the point. Okay, so this point is minus three, minus three, J4. So you have to figure out now what is M and what is your theta. So for figuring out that, what you can do here is uh, what uh, we have to find out the pole lens and the zero lens, okay? So for finding out the pole lens and the zero lens, you actually have to draw lines from that particular point. Okay, so this is say pole length. Okay. Then you have another pole length. Okay. 
So other four length here. Then you have one zero length. Okay, so you have one zero length here. So the blue ones are actually the pole lens and the green ones are the zero lens. So this is your J omega axis. This is your sigma or the real axis. So how can we find out M and theta? So basically we have to find out M and theta. So for finding out the M, we can say that zero length is m1 so say this is your m1 this is your m2 this is your m3 so we have to figure out basically the zero length divided by the pole length so m1 divided by m2 and m3 and what about the angle the angle say so this is your theta one this is your theta two and this is your theta three so for theta, what we can do is theta one, it is zero length minus the summation of the pole length. So theta one minus theta two minus theta three. Okay, so let us figure out what is M1. M1 is the length here. So from minus one to actually, this particular point. So well, the, just apply the Pythagoras. So distance here is distance here is minus actually two. So minus two, two, because we are applying the Pythagoras square will be there. So two square plus four square. Is it okay? So four plus 16 root over 20. And what about theta, theta one? Theta one will be actually we're interested about this angle here, this one. But instead, it is easier to calculate this angle here. So that is why what we are going to do 180 degree minus tan inverse height by base. So height is we already know from here, height is four, base is two. So four by so that will give you 180 degree minus 63.434 eventually that is 116.564. Okay, so uh, we're just keeping track of the positive angle uh, by uh, taking the uh, counterclockwise direction. That's it. So M2 is uh, root over now for m uh, m2 actually starting from the origin so the whole distance will be there so root over uh, 3 square plus 4 square so basically 5 uh, 25 25 root over 25 is nothing but 5 so and theta 2 theta 2 is tan inverse sorry uh, you have to apply 180 degree minus tan inverse uh, 4 by 3 so if you simplify, then you're going to six, that it will be 126.86. Now, the third one. So M3. For M3, what we have is, uh, M3 is this one. So the distance here is actually one unit. So basically one square plus four square. So basically root over 17. And what about theta three? Theta three is 180 degree, because as long as you know what are the parameters, by the, uh, height and the base, then you can easily apply the tan inverse for, uh, formula. So tan inverse four by one. So if you apply the thing, then what you're going to get is 104.036. Just apply the calculator. Put the calculator into the degrees angle so it will be easier for you to do the thing. 
Now, what is your M? M equal to is actually M1 divided by M2 uh, into M3. So what we are getting, getting here is M equal to uh, root over 20. That is M1 divided by M2 is 5. M3 is root over 70. So you're going to get an angle of, uh, sorry, the magnitude of 0 0.217. Likewise, what is theta? Theta is theta 1 minus theta 2 into, uh, minus theta 3. So basically, 116.565 minus 126.86 minus 104.03. So what you are going to get is minus 114.3, approximately something like this. So this is how uh, value of any point the value of any function at any point can be figured out using uh, finding the magnitude and the angle of uh, the value of the function at that point. Okay, so this idea will be helpful for us. Uh, okay, so uh, while we are calculating for the root with us. Now, the method that I have shown here, you try to apply that method to skill assessment exercise 8.2. Two, uh, sorry, 8.1. Okay, so you try to solve it and then try to verify the result that it, they have given. Okay, so now go for the next uh, article that is 8.2, defining the root locus. So now with the discussing all about the review of the vector representation of the complex number, as well as finding the any value of any a function at any particular point. We now finally can go into the article 8.2 that is uh, defining the root locus. Okay, for that we are assuming a security camera, camera system. Security camera system. Okay, so a, a simplified transfer function uh, block diagram representation of it is something like this. We have gain k1 here, and then we have transfer function k1, k2 by s into s plus 1, s plus 10. So this is simplified transfer function, and the feedback is 1. So we have something like this. This is your CS, this is your RS. Sometimes I'm, uh, common terms I'm not writing, but you try to use the book to see what are the, so this is, this may be the signal that you're getting is not high enough. So amplifier can be here. And this is uh, K2 by S plus S, uh, S into S plus one is a combination of your camera, camera plus motor transfer function. Okay, uh, what is CS? CS is, uh, okay, this security uh, camera system is actually can follow the object. So object following or subject following uh, camera. So this is your sub, uh, output is the camera position. And the input or the reference input is actually subject's position. Okay, so we're actually comparing those two, whether there is an error in the system or not. So if there is no error, then uh, the camera should be able to clearly follow the subject. Okay, so now if you take the uh, multiply K, uh, because if, if you try to reduce the block diagram reduction, then K1, K2 can be multiplied together. And we are assuming that multiplication of those two is K. So this is S into S plus 10. Okay, so this is your reduced block diagram. Then you have your feedback as well. So now if you further reduce into a closed loop transfer function, then what we are going to get is K by S square plus 10 S plus 10. Just do the calculation, nothing else. So this is your closed loop transfer function, RS, 
Así es. Okay, so now the denominator here is actually our characteristic equation. So s square plus 10s plus k equal to zero. This is characteristic equation. Now uh, k equal to zero because we said that we are going to plot for a variation of the k from uh, zero to infinity. Okay, so k equal to zero starting point. So what is our equation that becomes s square plus 10s equal to zero. So if you simplify a bit, what we're going to get is out of it is s equal to zero and minus 10 are the two points of the system whenever k equal to zero. Now k equal to five. If you make k equal to five, then what is happening to our system? So s squared plus 10s plus five equal to zero. Now we cannot just simply uh, use this some simple formula to figure it out. So basically s one, two. So find out minus b, minus b is minus 10 plus minus root over b square. That is 100 minus four into a into c, so 20 divided by two. So what do you have is minus five plus minus root over 80 by two. So if you do a, a bit of manipulation, what we are going to do is minus five plus minus, plus minus 4.47. So eventually if you take the plus sign here, then we are, what we are going to get is from the, from the plus sign minus 0 0.5. 527 and from the minus sign you can get minus 9.47 okay so this is the two value now they are actually shifting as you can see the zero is moved to this location with the change of the gain and minus 10 pole is look changed to this position so if you take another value say k equal to 10. So k equal to 10, then you have s square plus 10 s or 10. So, uh, but we are doing the calculation here to establish the root locus, but in general, we are not going to apply this sort of calculation. Okay. So this is how it is. So s one, two, if you do the calculation again, minus 10 plus minus root over 100 minus, so this is four into 100, so for, uh, four into 10, so 40 divided by two. So what we are going to get here is minus 1.13 and plus, minus 8.87. So again, if this one moved, further moved, this one further moved, and now k equal to 25. So if k equal to 25 you apply, then s square plus 10 s plus 25 equal to zero. So basically this is becoming S plus five whole square equal to zero. So S one, two is becoming both of them in the same location, minus five, minus five. Okay. So what will happen if you could K equal to further you increase? So K equal to 30 now. So S square plus 10 S plus 30. So equal to zero. Now S12 will become minus 10 plus minus root over 100 minus 4 into 30. That is actually now 120. So this value is now negative. So divided by 2 A. So what we are going to get is minus 5 plus minus because the fact is it is negative J. Uh, if you figure out the value, that will be 2.236. Okay, so uh, if you keep increasing the value of the k, only this value is changing. This is not getting changed. So basically minus five will be always there. So rest of the magnitude of this one will keep increasing with the increase of the k. So if we try to plot this, then what we are going to see here, so this is our J S plane. 
and we have so one pole here okay, whenever k equal to zero and on pole here so this is your minus 10 this is your zero so next instance it is uh, nine pole minus nine point seven four seven this is minus point five so next in instant is eight point something here then you have one point one something here then eventually they are meeting both of them are meeting in the same location minus five and and which is for k equal to 25 then further increase with the k now we are actually moving here here so the one that is uh, with the positive sign of the calculation we are following this path the negative sign of the calculation of the roots we are following this path so because of the fact that this minus five is not changing, you're always going the, you're keeping the same location. So you're moving in this direction. Okay, so if you plot this line, if you plot this line of the roots, then this is known as root locus or root is uh, another name of the pole eventually. So you're going to have something like, so this is your part of the root locus. Is it okay? So this is uh, the positive sign going upwards, always maintaining the same uh, real value. And the other one coming from here, actually eventually going downwards. Okay, so this is the definition of your root locus so whenever the system parameter is varying the representation of our uh, closed loop poles graphically is called the root locus now what the information uh, uh, from the calculation that we get so from the calculation what information we get is that value k equal to 25 is critical so at this point, both the rule is, uh, root is in the same location. So this is what is called from chapter four, if you can recall. Without the chapter four, it's difficult to understand chapter eight. So try to review a bit. So this is critically damped, critically damped system. So if the value of the K is lesser than 25, then both the root is actually on the real axis. So this, type of thing we call over damped over damped system okay and if the value of the k is greater than 25 as you can see you now have both of them isn't it real and the imaginary both you have so basically you have real, you have imaginary, and they appear in complex conjugate. So basically, we can say this is under damped system. So under the influence of the damping, so under damped system oscillation that you're going to have. So this is from chapter four, what do you get? Now from chapter eight, what information we can get? First of all, what information we get that for uh, the under damped condition, is there any change in the real axis? Sigma D is not changing. So from chapter eight, what information we can get is, Sigma D is constant. Sigma D is constant, constant, which is minus five. So uh, we know that our settling time is a function of your Sigma D. So basically, settling time is also constant number one number two what about omega s so omega s is increasing isn't it so uh, first instant we are having here second we are having here second and here so with the increase of the k omega d is changing so if omega d is changing, what will happen to your peak time? Peak time is a function uh, formula is something like this, isn't it? So omega d is changing. So your peak time is going to reduce. And also uh, with the increase of the k, with the increase of the k, our this uh, line is actually moving uh, upwards, isn't it? So what it means, this, 
angle if it is theta. So cos theta is actually your zeta. So cos smaller is higher, isn't it? So if you increase this value, then your zeta angle zeta is going to reduce. If zeta is going to reduce, a percentage over should, should also increase. So higher and higher value of percentage over should be uh, figured out. So this sort of uh, uh, transient behavior we can know. Now, what about the stability? So these are transient behavior. Now, what, what is happening to your stability? Is a transient behavior. Now, stability. Sabin, uh, is any condition? Is there any condition that your system is uh, roots are going to the negative half, uh, sorry, positive half side or right half plane? So, as you can always see, that it is always going either down or up, but none of them is coming back to the right half plane. So, our system is always stable. Always stable. Uh, is there any uh, oscillation, sustained oscillation, continuous oscillation? No, because this is the location of the sustained oscillation. So we are not going to J omega axis. So basically oscillation, there will also be no oscillation for this uh, system. Okay, so a lot of information we can actually extract without doing much calculation. We'll see in the next uh, topics that we can draw without all this calculation, the graph, and we can extract this sort of information without actually going through detailed calculation.